ladies and gentlemen, for inviting me. Um, I got involved in politics here a year or two ago, ran for mayor up in that moor, and um, they put a mic in front of me, and I about blew the whole house out. Uh, everybody said, boy, that guy's angry. <laughs> so my wife warns me anymore uh, about losing the campaign. That might have been the whole reason I lost. I don't know. I thought they all liked me. <laughs> uh, but uh, my wife always warns me anytime I'm speaking, uh, Lord, don't talk too long and don't talk too loud. <laughs> so thank you for not giving me a mic. I'm not comfortable with technology. I, I do a little morning radio show up in that morning radio station. We call it Lloyd and Friends. <laughs> interesting conversations with interesting people. And uh, every day I have a new guest. Most of them are from local, local at morning. People say, well, how are you going to continue that? I mean, how many interesting people are there? <laughs> I said, well, in Atmore. They don't have to be from Atmore. Uh, but, uh, you know, I try to get that more people if I can. And I said, well, I'm kind of like Will Rogers. You never met a man he didn't like. I've never met a man who wasn't interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you talk with almost anybody long enough, they, you'll find that they are very interesting, quiet people. Uh, can come up with the most off-the-wall philosophies of how they live <laughs> and what they believe. You know, they, some of them still think that Elvis is walking around and, she, you know, they think they never did land a guy on the moon. And some of these characters are really funny. I mean, they don't, they're not polished, but they're really funny characters. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of person I'm uh, looking for on my radio show. And uh, they wanted me to do two hours. And I said, well, let's just do an hour. I'm not sure how well this is going to go. I don't want to bore anybody having a conversation for an hour. But almost from the time we started, it seems like we're just getting warmed up when it's time for the show to be over. And so, um, uh, I'm not gonna talk for an hour though. Uh, not anywhere near it. Uh, my wife has me up past my usual bedtime tonight. My son calls me from Seattle occasionally and he's always alarmed. Of course, he's two hours behind me, uh, two, uh, that we're in bed. I said, what are you doing in bed? I mean, it's only like five o'clock here. <laughs> so, uh, 7 o'clock, that's what time we go to bed. <laughs> go to bed with the chickens. Go to bed with the chickens, yeah. Uh, sometimes my wife will find ourselves going with this dark, especially uh, going in there to lay down in the bed and we'll look at one another and say, What are we doing? <laughs> <coughs> What's happening to us? But anyway, I, as you can tell from my voice, I've been nursing a cold for a few days and I'm, uh, I'm a little hoarse, so I'm not going to talk too loud and I'm not going to talk too long. Uh, about 30 years ago, I have a brother. There were five brothers in my family, and uh, the baby was the girl. Uh, we were almost, all of us were almost named uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah Louise. Uh, Mama wanted a, she wanted a girl right from the start, and so she named her girl Sarah Louise. And in those days, as you know, you didn't know what you were getting until it got there. And so Mama named my older brother Ronnie, named him Sarah Louise, and then I came along, I was the second of the five, and she named me Sarah Louise, and right on down, she named every one of us Sarah Louise. Well, by the time uh, she had the sixth one, she had about given up. She didn't even like that name anymore. She'd given up on having, <laughs> on having a, uh, a girl. And uh, so, but lo and behold, she had a baby girl, and, and she said, oh, I don't know, we don't have a name picked out. I think she had him named Leroy or something. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't going to work for a girl. So my brother, who was in the first grade, I named Philip. And uh, so Philip said, I know a name. He said, I have two little girlfriends that I'm just terribly in love with. Uh, one is named Susan, and the other one is named Wynale. And Mama said, well, which one do you like the best? And he said, well... I can't make up my mind. So she said, well, we'll just name her Susan Wynell. And that's what we did. We named her Susan Wynell. And so uh, this brother, Philip, uh, it's a long way of introducing Philip. Philip was uh, Miss, uh, Miss uh, uh, what was her first name? Gwen, uh, Ru was it uh, Miss Stone? Patty. Patty. Miss Patty Stone. She taught all of my family, you know, all my brothers coming up. And she's often said, well, you know, you Auburn boys, uh, you always, uh, Philip was the only one of you that was really smart. The rest of you kind of faced it. Everybody thought y'all was smart, but Philip was the only one that was really smart. And uh, he was. Philip was smart. He was an artist. 
And as we were growing up out there in Oklahoma, we lived out on dirt roads. Uh, we used to get so bored. Uh, if a car come through, you know, we'd all run out to the road to, to wave and see it. Uh, my grandmother lived just across the cow pasture, and if a car, somebody came, it, before they could get in the house, she'd be in the back back door there with her big straw hat on, like she used to pick peas in. And uh, she'd be in the back door saying, who is that? Who is that? And uh, so anyway, she was very nosy. Not much happened out there in the country. My brothers and I, we, we had uh, run around barefooted. Daddy... Uh, Daddy taught us a lot of, uh, of, of wrong things in those days. You know, parents, uh, well, you know, we didn't talk about the birth process very much in those days. And they used to talk about the doctor finding us. You know, such such a doctor found you. And I said, well, Daddy, where did he find us? And he said, well, I turned a stump hole. I turned the woods. And my brothers and I would play in the woods. We'd go off all day long. And we, all, we had, each of us had a stump hole picked out where we actually thought that that's where, that's where uh, Daddy found us. In that stump hole. And so Philip, uh, it, was, it was hot in those days, and it was a farm area, so lots of flies. Cows and stuff everywhere, a lot of flies. And during the summer, you know how the gnats are. You know, they get in your ear and like fly around in circles about a million miles an hour. And uh, we didn't have air conditioning in those days. And my brother, he would draw on everything. Uh, Mama got a big family Bible one time. It cost her, I think, $50, which was a lot of money back then. And you know how those empty pages right in the front. Philip drew cartoon pictures all over the family Bible. He would draw all over everything, draw all over the walls. He raised his children that way. They just draw all over the walls. He didn't want to he didn't want to impede their creativity. Don't be crazy. And young and seated with him. So in any event, Philip uh, he went on and uh, he went to college and uh, got his art, a degree in fine arts and he was a terrific artist and I saw these these art pieces that he was doing. And at that time, about 30, 35 years ago, I was selling life insurance here in Pensacola. And uh, I saw those pictures and I was just in awe of them. You know, I've always been in awe of things that I do not understand. And art is one of them. I love art because I have no idea how they do that. I heard um, little Opie, what's his name? Ronnie Howard. Ronnie Howard. I heard Ronnie Howard say, <laughs> Somebody was asking him, you've been in the movies since you were just a little boy. You must know everything about movies. And, and Ron said, actually, I don't. He said, you know, the music, the musical score, he said, I have no idea how they do that. He said, I've always been in awe of those people who do that because it does so much for the movie, setting the mood and so forth. And he said, I don't know how they do that. I have no idea. And so, like Opie, uh, I have always been in awe of things I didn't understand. So... You know, that just in my mind reinforced the fact that my brother was, he was a genius. Uh, you know, I mean, he was very good with a pencil and he started doing these art pieces and I said, Philip, uh, look, I'm a super salesman. I, I could sell anything. In those days, I thought I could. Through the years, I found out I couldn't, but I, I thought I could then. I said, how about if I sell some of those for you? He said, oh, nobody will buy those things. I said, I don't think so. So we, I started promoting my brother, and we got him on some radio programs, and we started having some art shows, and people would come and see those art drawings, and they would say, what in the world is that? Is that a photograph? Or how, how? And uh, what he would do is he would take old photos, old black and white photos, and he would piece them together, and he would create a profile of who that person was. I say that the person was a, owned the first sawmill in town. He would say, I need a picture of that old sawmill. Or he had an old mule named Henry. Can you get me a picture of that old mule? And he would put those things together. And sometimes a guy would be standing a certain way, and they say, "Well, yeah, but Grandpa didn't stand that way. This is his face, but this is not the way he always stood." You know. So he would, he could put together these art pieces that were just that were just amazing. And uh, so I started uh, selling art for my brother Philip. We opened a little art studio in Atmore. Not the best place in the world to open an art studio. <laughs> <laughs> People in Atmore don't tend to be that artistic. <laughs> but anyway, uh, as time went on, my brother, uh, we about all went bankrupt. I quit my job and we started this little business and my brother, um, finally he just get, got to where he just didn't want to do it. He said, you're trying to get me to prostitute my talents. Oh. He said, I want, to cre I want to create something that lives beyond me, and you're trying to sell stuff, and, and you're trying to make money off of me. 
And I just couldn't make him understand. And so, anyway, we didn't talk for two or three years. We broke up. And uh, so we all had to go get a job. We were all we had just pushed it to was about to starve. So uh, he and I and, and uh, another buddy of mine that did was doing picture framing for me there. We drove to Louisiana and got a job working in the oil fields. Now I had never been on an oil rig. Didn't know anything about it. But here I was. I was a mud locker on the oil rig. I don't know if any of you know what that what he does. But he works in a little trailer and he monitors the all the stuff going on on the rig. And I I would be out there for several weeks at a time and just crying in my beer. And I used to work with this old boy named Rabbit from Mississippi. I don't know what his real name was. But, but his name was Rabbit. And uh, you know, I was I was whining to Rabbit one day, you know, you know, God just did not give me any talent. He gave my brother is so terrifically talented that if you could just see, I, I you know, I could have made something of that guy. And the guy just wouldn't cooperate with me. And, uh, you know, and I said, God gave me no talent. I can't even play the radio. I mean, I can't draw a deformed out. I have no talent. And Rabbit said, well, Lord, uh, you know, we sit out here all these hours out here on the oil rig, and we talk a lot, and uh, you're always telling me these stories about boyhood characters and these different stories. He said, why don't you write some of that down? I said, hmm. Hmm. And we had a little uh, royal typewriter out there, a little manual typewriter. And I sat down and I started bleeding stories. I just started typing that. It's every day, every minute I had extra, when I wasn't watching that panel, I was over there typing a story. And I was working the night shift. And Rabbit would come in every morning and he'd read that story and he'd go, that's about all I get out of it. <laughs> uh, but that started me writing stories. Through the years, over the last 30 years or so, I've written for several smaller newspapers. I just, I, you know, you all know what I'm saying. I just love to write. Mostly, I, I wanted to find out if I could do what I thought I could do. Okay. When I started writing stories, I thought I was a good writer. I wasn't. Uh, when I sat down and actually started trying to handle dialogue, and to try to get my story to flow, I, it was very awkward. Uh, I had always before, I've always been a good writer. I wrote stories even in junior high school. Uh, in the military, I was a criminal investigator, and I, I had written technical uh, documents, uh, you know, investigative reports that they had when I went to the CID school in Fort Gordon, Georgia. They kept my report on the, on the poster there for several years as the perfect report. And uh, so, you know, I, I had written, when I was in the investment business, I had written investment documents, you know, or to raise money and so forth. So I had a good, solid technical writing <coughs> skill. But uh, I, I found that I, I, it was a learning curve to learn how to tell a story. Now, I come from a long line of storytellers. My father was a storyteller, and my mother was a letter writer. Uh, when I left home, my mother always wrote us boys letters, and we answered her back. And, you know, back in those days, you'd meet a little girlfriend somewhere, and you'd start writing letters, you know. And you'd get those letters, and they'd be handwritten, have a little perfume on them, you know. You'd run to the mailbox and get a letter. And letters just become, became something to me of great importance. And we're, my wife has recently started doing a little quilting. It's one of those things that seems to be passing. Nobody writes anymore. They don't even teach children how to write anymore. In this yeah. So I always had a love for writing that I got from my mother. My mother once said that there's nothing gave her greater joy than a, than a nice writing ballpoint pen and a nice crisp, clean sheet of paper just to write something on it. So I have always been a journal writer. I got that from my mother. And uh, my father was quite a storyteller. He wasn't much of a writer, but... You know, I knew there was an art to telling stories. And when you grow up where I did, everybody's a storyteller. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the, the art of taking something, a verbal tradition, and we're talking about how literature, how, how fiction can, uh, I can't remember the exact wording, Richard, but uh, uh, tradition and history, how fiction enhances tradition and history. Um, to write something down, you lose all of your facial expressions, you lose your voice inflection, uh, you lose your hands waving all about, you know. All you have is just cold, hard words. Yeah. 
and and you have to do that. I was in a writers group I helped start up out in uh, Milton about ten years or so ago. That's still going on. Um, and uh, Myra Schaffner, do any of you know Myra? Mm -hmm. uh, I used to. Everybody loved my poems. I would stand up and read the poems. Everybody loved my poems. But Myra said, Lloyd, I would always give them the story behind the poem, and then I would read the poem, and they loved the poem. She said. Lloyd, your poem has to stand on its own. You're a wonderful storyteller, but you're setting them up for the poem. That's why they're liking the poem. I mean, hopefully that's not the case, but it was a possibility. And so I, I listened to Myra, although she thought I never listened to that, she said. And most of the time I didn't. <laughs> but I did listen to that. And I think it has made me a better writer through the years of trying to understand how can you... How can you put a vision to that? How can you put sound and smell in, into those words? Mm -hmm. It's a very hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard thing to do. Uh, this is my first novel, Baby Blue. Um, somebody asked how long it took me to write it. I think it took me probably six months and maybe another year of tweaking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a technical writer, I learned to write in the Marine Corps. I spent eight and a half years in the Marine Corps and I started out as a, as a clerk. And we used to have to type those orders and all kind of stuff on the old manual typewriters and you'd sit there all day long and pound those things out. And you'd write correspondence for the officer and, and if you messed it up, he'd send it back to you. And you and you have to do it in carbon copy. You know? So you had to either make neat erasures and it had to be nice and clean. So this is not really good for creative writing, but it's just the way I am. And I'm sure all of you have picked up habits from somewhere that aren't necessarily good. I wish that I could sit down and just write and then go back and clean it all up. I just can't do it. I have to clean it up as I go. You know, I edit as I go. And I know that's not a good thing to do, but that's just the way I learned to write uh, from technical writing is to edit as I go. So that I, and even with that, I can't say enough about editing. If I read my book a hundred times, I'd find an error every time I, every time I read it. And, you know, a lot, I hear a lot of people say, well, I think I'll write a book. You know, I don't know much about grammar and such, but, they, you know, they have people that do that. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody, especially an editor, is ever going to read your book if it's dirty, if it's, if it's tacky, if it's, not, if it's got misspelled words. So I thank God and my, uh, all my Marine Corps supervisors and mama and everybody that taught me how to put words together. I do think that I am... Uh, that I have that talent of putting words together to say what I want to say. Probably should have been a lawyer, which I have one brother that, that is. <laughs> uh, but uh, when I started this journey of, of writing, I learned how to tell a pretty good story. I could write a short story. I could start here. Most of my stories have been about characters, and they continue to be. To me, the character is the strongest part of any story. That's the person you're going to remember. Uh, and so I would just find a character and I would just tell a story about that character. And a short story might run 2,000 to three, 4,000 words. And uh, I could do that without much problem. I could, I could go back and tweak it and polish it up and it was good to go. Same way with read, writing an, uh, a newspaper editorial type, okay, an essay. I love to do that and uh, I never had any trouble with it. But when I sat down to write a novel, I had this idea in my head. It was actually from, from, from some fragments of dreams that I had had. And it was also had to do with a story that happened in my family uh, some year, many years ago. And I didn't want to really tell that story as a, you know, as real. But I thought it was, uh, I thought it was fascinating. And so I, I had this story roughly that I wanted to tell. But every time I would sit down to start to write it, <coughs> I got lost. I just got lost. I, I said, where am I going? What am I doing here? And uh, finally, a friend of mine told me, said, uh, Lloyd, you've got to write that last chapter. I, said, I don't like structure. You know, I like to have my characters come to life. You know, I like to start writing about them and then have them start telling me what they want to do and, and so forth. And that's the way I had always developed characters before. But I could do that with characters, but I couldn't do it with a story. Mm. The story kept going all different directions. Mm. And so I finally, that's what I had to do. I had to write the last chapter, and I had to sit down and diagram that book. Because if you're teaching a class, I learned this in teaching training years ago. Some of you, Richard, are teachers. If you're going to teach a class, you have to have one main objective. You'll have people in the audience 
mostly intelligent people that will just take you all kind of different directions. But you have to keep it to one main objective. And that's what I had to do to write my novel. I knew where I was going with that story. I knew where that story was going to end from the start. And so when I started to meander and wander around, I would have to tighten it up and bring it back to that story. The people in my story, uh, Baby Blue, <clears throat> I'm already, am I 30 minutes into okay. No, we got you okay. Uh, Baby Blue is the story of a, uh, two little boys find a, a dead man in the woods one day, up in the woods of Nokomis. Uh, the settings are all true settings in the story. They find a man, his head blown clean, uh, clean off. Uh, the murder happens in chapter one. Uh, this happened, they find the body in chapter two. Uh, the murder happens from an old black man who rides a horse and carries a shotgun. He's a moonshiner. And he meets this young white man, uh, maybe 30 years old, handsome guy, out in the woods, and he kills him. Uh, and the story is about why. Not about who done it, but why he done it. And so the two little boys find the body the next day, and they summon the, uh, the, the law enforcement, and who happens to be a, uh, a deputy sheriff, uh, a big tall guy by the name of J.B. Coon. And uh, J.B. was a World War II veteran, and uh, he was a farmer. He raised hogs, and he didn't know much about police work. The only reason he really had the job was because his cousin was the sheriff. And in those days, everybody done that way he sold moonshine. And his cousin made more money, you know, taking care of his moonshine buddies than he did force of the law. His cousin was, a, a, like most people in 1951, a, a racist and a, a real uh, disgusting example of law enforcement. But J.B. got his job because his cousin gave it to him. He said, you're a big guy. And from Pensacola, uh, my daddy told me one time, uh, he told me a lot of stories about, it was like, it was like, a, it was like a, Okay, corral up there in that morning. I mean, these guys carried guns in those days. They did. They all carried guns and knives, and they'd go to church and they'd get drunk outside the church and go to fighting and cutting and, and everything. And I asked my father, I said, Well, did they ever go to jail? He said, Well, most of the time, the law enforcement came out of Pensacola, and they didn't want to come all the way up here to the north end, you know, to put out a little fight. So, so the sheriff had, had hired his cousin, J.B. Coon just to be kind of a head knocker. You know, just if you get any hogs or chickens stole, or, you know, or two guys get in a fight, you, you know, straighten them up. And J.B. would do that. You know, if somebody caught beating his wife, J.B. would go out there and work him over a little bit. You know, <laughs> and then straighten him up. But he knew nothing about a murder case, but here he finds this dead man in the woods <clears throat> without a head. And his investigation begins to develop and leads him to one of the wealthiest families in the state of Alabama. Uh, they have secrets. Uh, they have skeletons. Uh, the story has racial elements. Uh, the, uh, um, you know, back in those days, mixed blood was quite a taboo thing. And uh, it's about mixed blood. It's about a woman who cannot decide who she is. She has uh, lived in white society and, and quite prestigious, wealthy family for a long time. And uh, these these events that take place lead up to uh, to the truth about where she came from and who she was. And it's a tragedy in a certain way, but it has uh, I think it has a good ending. Uh, the old man with the horse, I had a I had a reader heard me on a radio interview show and he called me and he said, Lloyd, I want to tell you that you have cost me two nights sleep. He said, I stayed up the last two nights reading that book. I could not put it down. And he said, but I want to thank you for the way you handled that old Negro man. He said, you let him out with dignity. And uh, he said, he was my favorite character in the whole book. Um, Atmore, uh, 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 I gave Atmore three copies of my book for the library. And the mayor's a friend of mine. I read it, well, even though he, I ran against him, he, he won. <laughs> so I saw Jim bought, Jim bought my book. And, and uh, so... He said, I said, well, uh, do they have a book in the library over there? And he called me in the evening and said, hey, I'll talk to the librarian. And they do, they do have your book over there, but it's always checked out. We could use another book or two. I said, okay, I'll give you a couple more books. But could I get a picture with you, you know, for the newspaper? He said, sure. So I went over to City Hall and gave him my, uh, uh, presented him the book. And it was printed in the paper. 
And as soon as I gave him the book, he called me into the back office and said, well, what? No, I sure am sorry. He said, but we can't have you. I said, we can't have you I have a sign over there. I said, why not? He said, well, because uh, your book is racist. He said, we've had a couple people on the library board say that your book was racist. I said, well, the hero of the book is the black, is the black guy in the book. He's the hero of the book. Uh, it was said in 1951, and I did use the N-word a couple of times in dialogue. Uh, but no, I, I did not concede that the book was racist. I, I think that, has anybody in here read the book? It's not racist. Did you see? No, it's not racist. Uh, it's completely the opposite. Characters. I had several people read the book that I thought, I have a, I have a cousin who has uh, <clears throat> mixed race children, and uh, you know, I, I let her read the book, and I let several people read it that I thought would give me fair, you know, I didn't want to be, to be racist, but I wanted it to be accurate. And uh, so, anyway, I, I think that probably went back to my mayor campaign. I don't think it. <laughs> I don't think that's what it really was. But I think it's a wonderful book. I think the characters are all very strong. Uh, I think the story is strong. And uh, I don't know. I'm like most of y'all. You know, I had the book in me. I wanted to write it, um, and I wrote it. And uh, I know that it's a great book. And so, if it gets in the hands of somebody down the road, I. Lots of people said they see a movie in the book. Did y'all? Did you see a movie in the book at all? Okay. You know, I think there's some possibilities. I uh, I've never written a screenplay, but it's one of those back table projects that I know I know I can write a screenplay. I think I might be able to sell it better if I wrote it as a screenplay. But then again, somebody told me, well, you know, Hollywood they don't like you writing your own screenplays unless you're like that's a not true. It's not. Cormac McCarthy just wrote an excellent screenplay. But doesn't Probably has he books, has he written screenplays before though? No. But he's a big he's a big name though. Yes, he is. But he's <coughs> a big name. Yeah, he yeah. And it probably uh, you know they have their own guys they like to mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. But uh, you know you never know. I, I, that's a project that I've thought of tackling the screenplay writing because I think that's really where the money is. Well, first but you got to get the option. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about it uh, for my story. Uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed writing the book. I've, had, I've published my second book, which is, uh, I've had this for 30 year collection of stories. And I wrote, I did a newsletter for 15 or 20 years. I call it the All Bread Letters. It was basically musings and philosophical banter and stories. And so I pulled out all of my stories and published them as the All Bread Letters. It's a, quite a different kind of a read. It's, a, it's more historical. It's about my growing up, the characters that I knew out in Oklahoma, up in the north end of the county. Boy, tell them the little story you told me about that somebody said that you said it was a book of fiction and they said, well, remember that? Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine that I grew up with over at one of my VFW meetings uh, recently came up to me and I went to school with him and his wife. He said, all Britain, my wife said to tell you that that book ain't factually accurate. I said, Mike, it's a novel for crying out loud. I said, it's, it's fiction. I made the whole thing up. And old Mike grinned and he said, my wife said you didn't. <laughs> she said she knows everybody in it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> truly, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think you have to write about what you know. Right. You know, and uh, that's what I did. I did uh, derive some of my characters that are easily recognizable. If you walk the same roads that I did, you'll recognize who they are. You know, otherwise it'd be just just characters. But I've always uh, observed, been an observer of characters and I can't, I don't know how to tell a story. Uh, well, I'll tell you as an example, I used to travel a lot in business and I, I uh, flew up to New York one time and a sales rep picked me up at the airport and he had his wife with him. They were both young in their 20s. And I was telling him a story and his wife turned around and she said, you know Lloyd, how do you make up all this stuff? I said, I'm not making up anything. She said, you got a heck of an imagination. I said, I'm not making up any of this. This is what, this is what really happened. Uh, I told you about, my, I think the story I was telling her was how my brothers and I used to take Mama's safety pins. And uh, back in the early 50s, you know, the Elvis was coming along, and uh, all the older teenagers, they had these big horseshoe taps on their shoes. And that was very cool, you know, walking down that hallway at school and tapping those those. Uh, and so we didn't have any shoes like that, and we didn't have any taps. So we'd take those mama sex pins and pin them into the bottom of our feet. <laughs> you know, the heel. It didn't yeah, hurt. No, it was no, like it was, it was just so thick. Yeah, it didn't hurt. Because of running around on the dirt road, you know. But, 
They thought that was just wild. <laughs> I thought everybody did that. <laughs> uh, but do we have any questions? Lloyd, can you get your book on the internet somewhere? Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Okay. I posted okay. it through Amazon, uh, what do they call it, CreateSpace. Okay. I published it on CreateSpace. Well, do you have like a short section from one of your books that, that you would like to read before you, before you close out? How about if I read you a poem? There you go. Yeah. Woo-hoo! That'll, uh, oh, works for me. <coughs> that'll, uh, work better, I think. In fact, this I think. This is a literate society after all. <laughs> <laughs> after all. Hopefully. Oh. Uh, you know, I went to, uh, Myra used to say, Lord, you're not a poet. You are a, uh, what did she say? Uh, she called me something else. She's not really a poet. <laughs> so, well, you know, Robert Frost, I'm a big fan of his. He wrote about three poems that everybody knows. I got his books, and you know he wrote a thousand, probably about three that anybody mm -hmm. can recite. Uh, but if you can write one good poem, uh, let's just see where this. If I can find this. Uh, I was up in New York, and I had to drive down home. I had to go get my dog. My nephew had stayed with me for a while, and he took my dog home with me. So I said, I got to make a flying trip down to Nokomis and get my dog. <laughs> And uh, I got down there, and I turned around and came right back. And it was late at night, and driving about 11 or 12 o'clock, and I come in on that Garden State Parkway, going up to Taconic mm -hmm. Parkway, and finally got in late at home. And I had my little ice chest in the car. You know, I was going straight through, wasn't stopping. So I got in there, and I was, I was real hungry. <laughs> so I decided to make me a sandwich, and I couldn't find my mayonnaise. And it just, I said, man, you know, I can't eat a sandwich without mayonnaise. I know I, said, I know I always have mayonnaise. I'd never get caught without mayonnaise. And so finally I found my mayonnaise, and I had to laugh about it, and I wrote this little poem. What kind of mayonnaise was it? Tell me it was a dude. I don't think I've tried dudes. It was anything, but what's that mayonnaise I won't eat? Blue flag. I won't eat blue flag. Yeah, I don't like blue flag. Uh, oh, my dudes. Oh, man, it's okay, 330. I probably have some better ones than this one, but th this is one of my favorites. It's just kind of a comical point. And this is what I like to write. I love, <coughs> I love mayonnaise. I, I loved it even as a kid. When I put it on everything and even lit the lid. For there are very few snacks which cannot be made better with a little dab of mayonnaise and some lettuce and tomato. <laughs> of all my favorite dressings that may run in short supply, I had never run out of mayonnaise. I think I'd rather die. So when I took a little trip and stayed for several days, I was sorely vexed upon return when I couldn't find my mayonnaise. Oh, this just couldn't be, I grumbled, for I left a jar I know, almost full of mayonnaise on the shelf there down below. <laughs> I had my bread and bologna for a sandwich all laid out, but when I couldn't find the mayo after looking all about, I concluded that a burglar had come and robbed me blind. <laughs> Though all except the mayo seemed easy enough to find. What kind of sorry scandal, I reasoned in my mind, would steal my jar of mayo and leave all else behind. So I scurried to the, to the, to the market and locked the house up tight to get another jar of mayonnaise to get my sandwich right. That's when I saw the cooler I had taken on my trip in the back seat of my car. So I gave the lid a flip, and there I found my, my mayonnaise, as pretty as you please, right where I had left it with a bowl of crowded peas, a loaf of oat nut bread, some mustard, and some cheese, and another thing I had not missed, my extra set of keys. <laughs> I'm always losing things like my shoes and my cool rays, but nothing gets my goat like a missing jar of mayonnaise. <laughs>